Ultraman versus Ultra 7. Let's kick this off just with my little introduction. So first, before I can actually talk about Ultraman, we need to talk about <coughs> Ultraman's father, Eiji Tsuburaya. Born in 1901, Eiji Tsuburaya was a little kid when he saw his first movie. He was around seven years old. He was very, he just suddenly loved it, but not the movie itself. He fell in love with wanting to know how the movie worked. So he was able to, when he acquired a movie projector, he was just constantly tinkering with it to see how it actually projected the images onto a movie screen. And he was also really big into model airplanes. So he would, he ended up becoming like his town's best model per, a person who put together model airplanes because he would have them down to the exact detail that they looked like that they had just shrunk an actual plane. And he would go on, he, would go, he went to an aviation school, which then closed down because his teacher and a fellow news cameraman had died in a plane crash when they were taking a tour. And then he ended up getting invited into the movie industry. So when he was studying film, he would also study like how thick a wire could be before it would actually show up on camera. So in a lot of the Godzilla movies, yeah, today on DVD, when we watch them, you can see the wires, but back then, his wires were thin enough that the cameras could not actually pick them up at that time with film prints. So there's been a lot of debate like with remastering, well, if you get rid of the wires, you take care of, get rid of the original work, but at the same time, he intended the wires to never be seen. He then, he just kept working uh, at Toho, and then he started doing propaganda movies during World War II, until finally when Japan lost in the war, he was pretty much set that he could never do war films, because that's what the U.S. stated, is that you could not do any more war films. So that's what kind of encouraged Toho to do monster movies, especially with Godzilla, because you had obviously the atomic bombs, you had a boat called the Lucky Dragon Number no. 5 that was hit in hydro hydrogen bomb testing, which helped inspire Godzilla along with King Kong and Beast from 20,000 Fathoms. So I have here some clips just showing a little bit of Eiji Tsuburaya's work. Like in, move, in some of the movie scenes when they'd be in a forest, they would have planned that the monster's going to pull a tree branch out to attack the other monster with, but they wouldn't know what tree branch they were going to use. So they had to plant each tree individually to get a full forest so that any branch could be pulled out and used. And also, being that he was an expert in miniatures, a lot of the older stop movies had very detailed miniatures that looked like they could be an actual city. So here are some clips.
snippet of what Subaraya did with as I showed the trees the miniatures even the work when you look at Mothra all that was done with just a puppet on wires which is incredible to think they could do something with that technology back then and it's kind of sad that a lot of audiences today look at and go oh that's so cheesy looking but back then that was amazing and even then even today some of it just can't copy that amount of work so after Subaraya had his success with all the Toho stuff, he created his own production company, Subaraya Productions. He would, because television had become big in Japan, they, uh, one of the Japanese television stations wanted a series that was similar to The Outer Limits, or The Twilight Zone, one of those two. And they, because it, the series was widely popular on TV, they wanted to make their own version of that. So Subaraya created a series called Ultra Q, which was just individual stories. Each episode featured a new creature, a pigmon, a sea creature. And this lasted for, I want to say it was like 37 episodes. And as that was ending, the TV station wanted something else in addition. Something that featured monsters, but maybe a little bit different. So they asked Subaraya to create a superhero show. So initially, Subaraya was going to create this show called Red Man, which was going to be a red costume character who would fight creatures. I love Red Man. I've seen like little shorts. Yes, that actually is, uh, that came years later. Yeah, they eventually did create Red Man later on in the 70s, which was different from the initial concept. But yes, there was originally a concept. He was called Red Man, but they decided to change it up. The character was red and silver. Red for the color of Mars, and silver for the color of spaceships. So it's supposed to be essentially, the red is his muscles, and the silver is his armor. So when you come to think of it, if you know Power Rangers, that means Lord Zed is technically an Ultraman. <laughs> so in the original series, we have a character named Hayata, or Hayate. He uses this little capsule to transform into Ultraman. They gave him a capsule because they wanted to have, to, to have something that he could lose so they could have reasons for him to not be able to transform at times to extend the episode so that, oh, I dropped it down this sewer. Now I got to go retrieve it. Meanwhile, so he, these eventually kept on going. And I have here just a little snippet of his capsule and how he first becomes Ultraman. Oh, my God. 
you may notice about Ultraman is his main attack when he does this is called the Amer or su su spir wow. Specium Beam. Now I'm getting it mixed up with Orb. So the Specium Beam, that was his main way of attacking and pretty much when he did that it meant the monster was dead. If the monster didn't die from that attack, something really was going down. And he would occasionally, there's some positives and negatives with all this. He could pretty much pull up any power the plot required for him to win, but that was his ultimate ability to attack for finishing off a monster. He has a color timer, which pretty much states that after three minutes he has to revert back or he's going to die because of Earth's atmosphere. This is something that became a staple of the Ultraman series. For the most part of every series after Ultra 7, which I'll get more into later, it was a way that Tsuburaya felt would keep Ultraman from feeling pretty much invincible if he had a limit on how long he could actually be in, transformed for. The downside is, though, it's like Dragon Ball Z time. It goes as long as it needs to go if the plot requires it to. So when it, he could say this planet's going to blow up in five minutes and it could take 20 episodes to blow up. Also one thing you might know is between the Ultraman series, if you watch the original, was in the first 13 episodes, he actually had a different suit than what comes in later on in the series. Initially the suit was made pretty quickly, it was quite rigid on the front, pretty thin. And then they started, in the 14th episode, they started using a new suit that was a bit more muscular. The face was a little bit more flat, uh, rounded, and the mouth wasn't as deep. So, and that became pretty much the standard for your Ultraman series. So now I have here, Ultraman has a tendency to be kind of a douche to people at times, to the monsters. As I had in the first clip, sometimes I wonder, is he actually trying to kill the monster or rape it? <laughs> Sometimes I can't tell. So here's just a little taste of how much of a troll Ultraman could be. And that is a guy's in a suit.
So, yes? Maybe a new, but you said the red color is meant to be his skin, right? Mm hmm. So he's technically, uh. Yes. <laughs> yes. So he yes. might, in fact, be a troll. He, he seems to be flashing on doing. Yes. And he did hit the guy at the beginning. And then <laughs> either they are really. Either that radiation did something to him, or they were not drugs longer than we thought. <laughs> but yes, he will. He tortures. He rips this monster's collar thing off, and then pretty much taunts him with it. Like, look what I got. Do you want it back? Nope, you can't have it. I thought it was more like a man thing. Like Toro, Toro. <laughs> yeah, there's that too. Like, was that really him laughing in there? Yes. <laughs> I saw his mouth opening. And well, that's sorry. because the original suit, like I said, was really deep in the mouth, so it looked like his mouth was open. So that scene, when you see him laughing, it just fits so well with that mask. So did, did, so did people who made Mortal Kombat steal that then? <laughs> I don't know, but I had fun with that. Yeah. So. They, they actually have um, the whole Ultra Act line that's going on with their action figures in Japan. Uh, yeah, I've gotten the... Well, they canceled Ultra Act, and now they're doing fig, oh, yeah, in figure, figure art yeah, form. Sorry. I, I was gonna mix that, but um, the figure arts one, they actually have, they do different suits. Mm -hmm. So they have like the one that was like the original. Type one. A and then the yeah, main exactly. suit. I, I thought that was interesting, so I was like, oh yeah, they look Oh cool. yeah, I've got several of the figure arts and some of the aliens. Wait, Ultra And he's got so many pieces he what plays that with. What, oh, what they did is they just merged the Ultra Act line into figure arts to relaunch oh. the line with the new uh, body types that they're doing for figure arts, so it has new hip joints. They're also a bit smaller from the Ultra Acts because they're, they're more figure art, they're figure art sizes. But they've been coming with, they've been pretty much suit accurate in design. So they'll have the fins on the back to where the zippers would be hidden, and they'll have the wrinkles in the suit. Oh, that's cool. Nice. Yeah, whereas the old tracks are pretty much like, you know, Suit, yeah, they were like what Power Rangers is in the American toy lines. Yeah, exactly. So one thing Ultraman, as serious as Ultraman will get, because sometimes it will get downright dark and serious, but there's also bits of comedy. <laughs> like I have a clip here from an episode that is just hilarious to watch, and it's one of my favorite episodes of the show because it's so ridiculous. There's a monster that cannot be stopped and at like the end of the episode they pretty much have to shoot a rocket up its ass <laughs> to launch it into space but and here is <laughs> here I'm is sorry. Ultraman's fight against this monster <laughs> just trying to enjoy himself and here comes this big bad man like no you can't be here bullying him and everything but yeah there's episodes like that and that's the one nice thing is Ultraman has episodes of comedy episodes that are really serious and for a show from 66 being that I've watched it for the first time last year it held up really well under from my perspective 
So Ultraman has two different types of enemies that are throughout the show. The first type are kaiju, so giant monsters that pretty much are earth-based creatures, some are living in mountains, some are mythological beasts, like there's one episode that has a giant abominable snowman. So I got here just a couple samples of a few of the monsters of the kaijus in the show, one that also seems to love chocolate. monsters are aliens. Now with the aliens, obviously they come from other worlds. We have all different types. There's one that is in two episodes called the Balten, which have become kind of Ultraman's most infamous uh, uh, aliens. They're in most of the Ultraman shows. We've got, there's one that is actually one of my, probably my favorite of the season. His name is Mephilus, because in this episode, Ultraman does not defeat him. They pretty much declare the the fight a draw, and Mayfellus just leaves on his own, which is pretty awesome. Um, and then there have been some weird ones that have just been out there, like, huh? oh. And then there's some ones that just make me think of characters from video games. So let's take a look at a little bit of the aliens. Because I, I, I wrote it with friends, I'm writing up with friends. I love the Metal Gear Solid. Oh, I'm gonna get you the Metal Gear Solid. Hey, why you? Some boy them, they put a car on that thing, and who are they sell some things on that thing, and who are my money on that thing, you know? I'm not saying that I'm going to go and deal with the case proper. Yeah, it's just a couple of the aliens that you see in the show. Most of the aliens, unlike the monsters, which are pretty much brainless creatures, the aliens are usually intel intelligent beings that come down wanting to invade Earth for one reason or another. Sometimes they just want to kill humans because other times it's they lost their planet, so they come down wanting to take over the Earth because it's a planet that's just like their own, so they want to inhabit it. Now, in the last, in the series, there's an episode where the characters go to the Middle East, and I said in quotations because it's basically Japanese people with tan painted on them to act Middle Eastern. They find out that they're an Ultraman lived hundreds of thousands of years ago in the past and helped out this um, civilization. So there was this little mythology that occurred early on that there might be more than one Ultraman. The final episode of Ultraman actually brings in another Ultraman named Zulfi. And one thing you learn about Ultraman is they're basically space cops. So if you're familiar with the DC Universe, they're like the Toku version of the Green Lantern Corps. And I swear, Jocko in Dragon Ball is related to Ultraman because he looks just like an Ultraman character. But here is a little bit of footage from Ultraman's final fight and then the introduction to Zolfi. <coughs> <laughs> <laughs>
上では急激に消耗するエネルギーがなくなると胸の皮がたいまわりがないウルトラマンさてさてさてさてはやっそして、ウルトラマンは、ウルトラマンは、ウルトラマンは、ウルトラマンは、ウルトラマンは、ウルトラマンは、ウルトラマンは、ウルトラマンは、ウルトラマンは、ウルトラマンは、ウルトラマン
ended up becoming something was initially going to be had nothing related to do with Ultraman. It was in its own universe. And that's kind of what started the whole multiverse aspect of the Ultra series later on, so that the Ultraman could travel through universes, so that if one series didn't take place in the same universe, it was still possible that they were from the same planet. That's like if you've ever watched Ultraman Nexus, there's really nothing that connects it to the other series because it's in its own timeline, just like with Ultra 7, and then even Ultra 7 X in the 2000s did the same thing that was an alternate universe. So I have here, when Ultra 7, so in Ultraman, you had Ultraman pretty much fused with Hayata, so they would pretty much be the same person, they would just switch bodies. Again, if you know DC, think of Captain Marvel Shazam. When Billy Batson says Shazam, he transforms into this superhero. That was pretty much the same thing with Hayata and Ultraman's relationship. When he transformed, Ultraman took over and Hayata was just gone. Ultra 7 was different. He actually came to Earth, met a man who was really willing to risk himself, so he actually cloned himself to be just uh, to look just like that man and called himself Dan Moraboshi, so he could walk on Earth as a human. these type of glasses to transform which again they were made so that he could lose them which he seemed to lose a lot in the show there's actually two episodes in a row where his glasses get stolen by aliens so it's like and you're the hero what another aspect on ultra man ultra 7 is that he doesn't have a t color timer you don't even find out until episode 25 that his power actually comes from the sun so when the aliens block out the sun, that's when he starts to lose his abilities and get weaker. So it kept it dim, Brent. Now, like one of the negatives to the original Ultraman series is that the show can get re repetitious. It's very formulaic, a monster or alien inv attacks. They try to figure out how to beat it. They can't do so. Ultraman comes in, he starts to run out of time. He finishes the creature off quickly and leaves. Now with Ultra 7, because you didn't have the color timer, they didn't really fall into that formula because they would try to do different things. There were even episodes where Ultra 7 would, wouldn't even grow. He would stay human size, talk to an alien, and then that was it. That would be all you'd have of Ultra 7. And unlike Ultraman, which also usually the battle would happen in like the last five minutes of the episode, sometimes Ultra 7 would show up in the middle of the episode, and that was it. The rest of the episode was the force he worked for, Ultra Garrison, defeating the creature of the week. And another interesting aspect is Ultra 7 actually takes place over the span of like three or four years. There's one episode where this character who showed up in like 12, 15 episodes ago, they say, oh, it's been three years since he saw these characters. So that's another interesting aspect with Ultra 7 because a lot of these toku shows, they take place in real time, usually. So with Ultra 7, he's got a few different abilities. He's got a beam attack called a wide shot. He's got this laser that comes out that you'll see later on during the panel um, called the Amerium Beam. And then he has a blade on the top of his head that he'll throw called the Eye Slugger. And that is like the most violent weapon ever. And Ultra 7 is not one of those people that will just be nice. <laughs>
Yes, he even has, there's an episode where he actually shrinks himself to go into a human body and kills the monster with bubbles. It was hilarious. Also, unlike Ultraman, who was, as I call him, the original internet troll, Ultra 7 is kind of a bloodthirsty dick in this show. The next clip, there's an episode where these, where the Ultra Garrison creates basically a nuclear missile that they will use to threaten aliens, and if you come to invade our planet, we will nuke your planet. Sounds kind of familiar. And they actually do it on a test planet. They do it on a test planet that they think is in uninhabited, and a creature comes down that is practically invincible from the nuclear attack in rage. Here's what Ultra Seven does to this invincible creature. I see that hit. Is that where they gave the cheat from Dragon Ball? Is that where it could be? No, I say it looks just like that. You assume it could be in the beam blast. Quan chi him, like in Mortal Kombat, when Quan Chi would rip off your, your the opponent's leg and beat him with it to death for his fatality. This guy would be proud. And the fact that, the thing about this is, not only is it that he slits the monster's throat to kill it, and beats him with his own arm, but the happy music <laughs> playing in the process. So I had created this movie trailer for this one because it made me think of something we would see. Just when you thought it was nothing more than superstition. Ah. 
your worst fears come to life. <laughs> Seven is his own slasher for a slasher film, and it, and actually the subtitles were actually from an episode where it was Friday the Thirteenth. <laughs> so, at the beginning, when they were creating the concept of Ultra Seven, they were going to have Ultra Seven get these helper monsters, so that at times they could just have a helper monster uh, up here, so that when Dan would lose his glasses, he could use a helper monster. He could. Uh, just you, I just pretty much use it for toy sales. And originally they were going to take some monsters from the previous series and use it. Then they decided, you know what, Let, for toy sake, let's create three brand new monsters to be as helper monsters. And those were called capsule monsters. Be the tunnel. were pretty much aliens that were always trying to invade Earth. If there was a kaiju in it, it was because they worked for, they were pretty much sent by the alien beings. So I've got here quite a few clips of some of the creatures from the show. They were all sentient beings. Some had pretty interesting plot points. Like the first clip here is a monster decides to poison cigarettes. So to, to make everyone who smokes go crazy. よう、<笑> わ、我々は人類が互いにルールを守り、信頼し合って生きていることに目をつけた。地球を壊滅させるのに暴力を振るう必要はない。人間同士の信頼感をなくすればいい。人間たちは互いに敵視し、傷つけ合い、やがて自
So those are just a few of the aliens you'd see. Some, there's some interesting things that happen. So with the Metron with his cigarette plot, it makes for a great joke in Ultraman Orb. The Metron comes to the boss of the series. He's like, hey, uh, sir, not enough people in Japan are smoking anymore, anymore, so we're canceling the cigarette poison plan. <laughs> they actually? <laughs> yep. I have Obviously, seen. the creators have been smoking those cigarettes. <laughs> oh, yeah. And then we have a freaking dinosaur tank. My favorite. <laughs> That you can't get any cooler than that. Although I, I also like the battleship that you saw, Iron Rocks. He's basically an alien that was took all sunken ships like the battleship Yamato and merged them into one creature that was just a battleship. As I mentioned earlier, Ultra 7 would change up their formula at times. You'd have lighthearted episodes, you'd have really dark episodes. You had episodes that were comedic, you had episodes that were very sci-fi-ish, then you had episodes that were very horror-esque. So I have here a clip from one of my favorite horror-esque episodes that would please any horror fan, even if they're not a big Ultra 7 or Ultra person, you might, they might find themselves enjoying this episode. <laughs> taste the horror one. I have so much fun with those straps that come out that is, I, I think it looks like duct tape coming out at him. One final monster we have here from Ultra 7 has become a fan favorite who comes back several times with up upgrades. It's an alien creature that is four ships that merge into one robot. So let me show the clip of King Joe is his name.
that was just a little taste of what you can get out of Ultraman Ultra 7. If you have never seen the series before, I hope that this helps to uh, give a little insight on what was done back then to get your interest. Ever since after Ultra 7, Subaraya was like, that's the end, that's how the franchise is done. I've gone as far as I can, there's nothing more to tell. And then he sadly died in 1970. So his company decided in the early 70s, you know what? Let's restart Ultraman back up because Kamen Rider's taken off by Toei. We, there's all these other series out there now. We need to compete, so let's go. And Ultraman has pretty much had series ever since. And so that is the end of my presentation. Any questions? So, where did the Shout have the... Shout, okay, so here's the thing. Shout Factory did release Ultra 7 on DVD. Mill Creek has released the original Ultra series, Ultraman. And then Shout Factory has also released Ultra Q. Now, back in the 60s, the first several Ultra shows were licensed by a Chinese company called Chaya, who was given the license to to distribute the shows across the world outside of Japan. Chayo then said they own all rights to all Ultra series outside of Japan for those series and they have a letter from the owner of Subaraya stating they own all rights to it. So there was this constant battle for the last few decades that a court in, the, in LA last year declared that Subaraya does own all rights to their shows because they are the creator. So hopefully now that that's all settled, we will see all the shows get released on Blu-ray because a lot of them have been remastered in Japan on Blu-ray and that they will get re proper releases because a lot, also the problem with like Ultra 7 is the subtitles are not that great, they're mistranslated, but Shout could only go with the subtitles that they were given by Chayo. And what's really interesting now with that, um, there is another court case going on. We don't know what's going to go along with that, but before that happened, Shout Factory got the license to Ultraman Leo. So we're probably going to see Ultraman Leo's release here eventually. Yeah, and the nice thing is a lot of the shows are currently streaming on Crunchyroll because Crunchyroll has licensed the streaming rights to them. So they have, they have uh, Leo and 80, which were the show of shows, not, not under Chayo's tyranny. And then they have a lot of the shows from the 2000s and up. And um, so, that, so the subtitles for the most part are great, but some of them are actually provi subtitles provided by Subaraya. So there are some mistranslations, like actually uh, Ultraman Nexus, one of the episodes is called No, no Translation Available. <laughs> because they didn't have the translation for that title, so that's what the subtitles read. And you'll see that occur, a one, like, I think there's three moments in, throughout the show where when they're speaking dialogue, it says no subtitles. You know, they should uh, totally the make it up. The version I got, so Nexus has the subtitles so mistranslated completely because they keep on referring to Nagi, who we know as a girl, as a guy. There have been subtitles that have done that. And I'm like, okay. Alright, well, thank you so much. And have a good night. Yeah.